Any place in your body that can hold trauma is also a potential for holding wisdom. By understanding that, I also then realized that intuition isn't only a mental faculty. Through the same mechanisms that we can hold trauma in the body, there's hidden wisdom in the body. It's been called gut instinct for longer than we've understood all this, which also tells you somebody must have known something about how intuition is stored in the gut. But the serotonin hypothesis adds in the fact that the rest of the tissues of your body can also be holding trauma or hidden wisdom. So I would say intuition is its hidden wisdom. You talked about timing as one of the ways that you can use an intuitive ability or a connection to something greater than us in order to help us practically navigate life. If someone is starting out on their journey trying to increase intuition, first, it's the awareness that it's possible, right? What would you start to say to them to sort of open their minds that there's more to their experience than they're currently having? And I thought about the order of this really carefully. I've The chapters are called Connect with Your Senses, Connect with Your Intuition, Connect with Creativity, Connect with Nature, Connect with Your Tribe. So I would start with the senses because most people know that we have five senses. There is this phrase, the sixth sense, and, and sometimes people think it's balance, sometimes people think it's intuition. But I made a very strict kind of definition of what a, a sense is. So it had to be a stimulus that causes a, a receptor to um, produce a chemical that cre creates a response in the body. And so as I started, I found this um, journal paper that said, humans have potentially 22 to 33 senses. Now, obviously, having been at medical school, I knew about some of some of the ones that maybe the average person doesn't, which is like thermoception for temperature, nociception for pain. Rectal fullness, not something most people think about. Bladder fullness, stomach fullness, um, the pH of your blood, etc. So taste, for example, is subdivided into five. But umami was only discovered in the 1980s. So, you know, discoveries were going on. So I did a fuller literature review comparing a lot of sort of tables. And I came up with 34 senses. Um, you know, the immune system has recently been recognized as a sense. So, yeah, super interesting. But just already an example of that. We're so much more complex and um, sophisticated than we realize. That was the kind of first step. And then a big game changer for me with intuition that I've learned through my grief is that, you know that book, The Body Keeps the Score? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research on how trauma is held in the body. And in fact, that the Broca's area of the brain, where how we articulate speech, can get shut down by PTSD. Um, and so there's a limit to how far talking therapy can actually access all of that trauma. And that things like yoga and dance and art um, and craniosacral therapy and certain types of massage are actually more effective. Fascia work. Fascia, exactly. That's I discovered that during my grief. Um, at times, I went for some massages because I'd been so tense whilst Robin was ill that I, you know, and I hadn't gone for a massage for at least a year. But when I started going for them, they were so incredibly painful that it actually put me off mm. until I found this woman who does body realignment therapy where the massage would be so painful. It would make me f cry from the pain. But I realized I had, had to do that to get the grief out of my system. But by understanding that, I also then realized that intuition isn't only a mental faculty. For the, for through the same mechanisms that we can hold trauma in the body, there's hidden wisdom in the body that can be released through fascia work and other types of, of work. And um, the hypothesis for that, which is really interesting and exciting is the serotonin hypothesis. So people think that serotonin is to do with mood, but that's actually one of its smallest functions. And up to 95% of serotonin is produced outside of the central nervous system and cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So that serotonin does, you know, plenty of other functions in the body, but the word serotonin actually comes from serum and tone. Mm. So serum is blood, plasma, you know, all the li liquid products. And tone is how that hormone affects the capillary constriction or dilation, which then affects how much oxygen and nutrients go into tissues and, you know, how those tissues constrict or expand. That's what drives 
what I call hidden wisdom and trauma into the tissues of the body. So, you know, I've always been big on intuition and journaling, but it takes it to the next level if you understand that physicality is a really big part of unleashing that. It also brings up the idea that if people have restrictions from traumatic experiences in their body, it can impact their ability to access intuition. Is there like a trade-off? Like you can only have one or the other functioning at a, at a time. I love the way you've put that. And I think in the similar way that we have loss aversion or this you know, gearing in the brain to avoid loss more than seek reward, I, I agree with you. I think that if there's a lot of trauma held in the body, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trump the intuition. Um, and, you know, the condition of your gut-brain axis also um, contributes to whether you've got brain fog or you can access your intuition really well. The notion of kind of trauma being stored in the body is something that we, we talk about a lot, especially because there's so many different kinds of therapy, right? And most of us think that processing trauma is something you need to sit with a therapist and, and talk about. And I would argue that in many cases that component is important in terms of kind of mining information and framing it and giving it context. But where is the place where someone might be getting messages that the way they've been processing trauma might not be sufficient and it might be time to turn to the body? Basically, the, the PTSD circuits in the brain are around the hippocampus and amygdala, as I mentioned before, the memory and the emotion centers. Um, but with this serotonin hypothesis that I described, we do believe that, you know, that's just a small part of the circuit. Mm. And um, whether it's neurons, muscles, fascia, or even skin. I mean, we were talking earlier about visceral reactions to things. So I think... You know, in modern society, we've moved away from that a lot. But do you ever get a shiver down your spine or butterflies in your stomach? You know, I think starting to tap into that more is a good place for people to start. Mm -hmm. You know, what's your body telling you? What that also sort of leads to is a conversation around, you know, how far back can we go? Because I'm also wondering, you know, you had this very acute, very painful, you know, loss and also one that was extremely concentrated in that it was during this time when you were isolated together. But I'm wondering when, we, when people think about childhood trauma and, you know, all these things, how long and how far, right, into our nervous systems is this trauma being stored? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the longer that something's been there, the more deeply embedded it is. Mm. And what a lot of people with PTSD say is that I'm speechless or I don't have words or I'm dumbfounded. And, and that's because of that shutting off of the Broca's area of the brain. So when something's that distant in time, it's deeply embedded in terms of like, it's almost um, my colleague De Deborah Ancona at MIT has um, done some research on ghosts in the executive suite. And she talks about those values and secrets and boundaries that were like embedded into your psyche as a child that you're not conscious of the fact that they're still running your life today. Mm. I do feel really strongly that all the research points me to dire the direction that stuff from that long ago that you're no longer conscious of, there's no amount of talking therapy or writing therapy that's going to get to that. So I think all of the physical things that I've suggested, mm -hmm. um, like, for, for example, there's this charity called Ashes to Art, where firefighters that go into really traumatic scenes as soon as they exit the scene, they, they paint what they saw and it reduces, you know, they don't get PTSD. Wow. Yeah. What do you think is happening there? It's emotional processing, but it's, it's also got a physical element to it because PTSD often brings up images of what you've seen that you can't get rid of. So I think drawing it out and seeing it and having like, you, you know, physically created it yourself is, is stopping that suppression that keeps bringing this image back up, you know, because mm. you haven't processed it. It's also making yourself kind of the author of your story as opposed to being, you know, the subject of your story. I've also heard you describe doing art, dancing, music. In our ancestral history, we wouldn't have been safe to do that if we were not safe. So it kind of re-signals us to be like, oh, if I have the time to engage in these activities, then I must be safe in some way. Are we sort of wired that way in our minds to, to get that unconscious message? Well, I think there's two parts to it. I think that in, you know, Paleolithic times, we wouldn't have wasted resources on that if it wasn't crucial to our survival or somehow to our human spirit. You know, making totems, 
giving offerings to ancestors increased that sense of connection so that you had connection in your tribe, mm. but your tribe wasn't only people that were alive. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, these, these are like higher fu functions. So again, you would be relatively privileged to be able to indulge in these activities. It's also parasympathetic nervous system activating, yeah. right? Even the notion of being able to exhale, right? The reason that we're that we try and at least I say to my kids, if there's one thing I can teach you, it's about breath. Like if there's one thing I wish I knew, right? If your exhale is longer than your inhale, it indicates that you are not actively running you know, from a predator. So I think also these activities are engaging different parts of the nervous system that indicate you're okay to do this, you're okay to have, you know, for polyvagal theory, you're okay to have social interactions, you're okay to engage that way. Yeah, and like one of the things I really like about this field of neuroaesthetics is that how good you are at the art doesn't matter. The benefits are the same. Mm. So it's kind of that whole thing about, you know, dance like nobody's looking kind of thing. Mm. Um, just, just, you know, sketch, paint, dance, sing in the shower, whatever, you know. I just try to bring those things more into my life in little ways. Mm. But the biggest one for me is appreciating beauty. It's really changed my life. It's like gratitude next level. Because mm. I talked about loss of sense of self, loss of relationships, loss of connection to something greater. Noticing beauty, it just kind of like enriches that tapestry of life and it makes mm. you feel connected to something greater. And nature is one of the easiest ways to do that, as it were. Even if you don't, I always say, like, even if you live in a city, there's always weeds making their way through, you know, the pavement. There's always a sky. There's always clouds, mm. hopefully. One of the things that we we keep kind of circling back to when people talk about uh, consciousness is the ability to transcend this plane of consciousness. And we've spoken to theoretical physicists about it, and we've spoken to mystics about it, and we've spoken to all sorts of people about this notion of what does it look like and feel like to transcend that. And one of the ways that so many people are talking about is with the use of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we also talk to people who talk about deep meditation and you know ways that you can access it. But one of the things that we keep coming back to is this notion of filtering, right? And when we're in a, a, a transcendental state, are we filtering less? Are we filtering more? You know, is it the shutting down of the default mode network that's sort of always telling you the things that are wrong? And you actually talk about the um, ascending reticular activating system, um, or ARAS. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this aspect of filtration. Um, is that filtering out, you know, aspects that would interfere with us being in touch with something greater? What is that system for? Yeah, so that system is for the processes of selective filtering, selective attention and value tagging. Mm. So because we're bombarded with so much data, the brain helps us by filtering out things that we don't need to be aware of all the time. For example, you're not aware of your clothes on your body all day, even though they are touching your skin receptors constantly, because that's just wasted information that you don't need. In terms of basic survival, the brain has its own idea about you know what you need and what you don't need and it will you know if not directed by you it will filter out what it deems unnecessary pay attention to what it thinks is necessary and then tag those things in order of importance and people with attentional challenges or people who are on the spectrum sometimes have challenges in this arena of knowing what to pay attention mm. to and for how long yeah or if you've ever had a child with sensitivity to clothing, you know that sometimes they will tell you all day that they are sensing their clothing. Yeah, if if there aren't challenges, then that's happening naturally all the time. And so you notice things that are important and you move towards opportunities that are, you know, crucial for you. You can direct this system a bit. So there's a logical and an emotional element to it. So the logical one is more kind of like, this is basically what we need to survive. The emotional one is things that you want things you desire things that would make you thrive you know whether it's through like the action boards that I described in my last book or whether it's by making a list or just being you know visualizing things um you can direct that process a little bit but actually what Dr Bruce Grayson said to me is that the brain is probably filtering down what the mind is capable of so that we can exist on this material plane mm. and things like psychedelics or ecstatic dancing or 
conscious connected breath work can alter our state of consciousness and perhaps expand that ability, whether it's the suite of senses, whether it's our intuition, whether it's, you know, communication with other realms. And so there's also a really interesting piece of research um, called Shared Trait Vulnerability, which is about the connection between creativity and psychopathology. Creativity is obviously a positive personality trait, but there is a genetic um, connection to a higher likelihood of mental illness, such Mm -hmm. as depression, schizophrenia or um, addiction. And in Shared Trait Vulnerability, there's like an area of overlap that's really positive, but there are factors that can mean that you're in psychological crisis rather than you're mentally healthy and you can be really creative. So basically, they're to do with hyperconnectivity throughout the brain, so making associations that not everybody does. Mm. Low latent inhibition, which is to do with the filtering system and that filtering system being looser so that more stuff gets in. And then it's also to do with like your working memory and your cognitive flexibility. So if you've got a good working memory, a high IQ, you can think flexibly and differently, then you can get all the benefits of creativity to expanding your consciousness. But if you have a low IQ, if you tend to perseverate, which is go over the same thought process over and over again without being able to think flexibly, and you've got a poor working memory, then you're more likely to go down the path of experiencing psychopathology. Hmm. It's like the it's like your genetics have a formula, yeah. right? Yeah. For how able they are to be flexible and creative emotionally. Hmm. So, you know, creativity, therefore, is potentially a conduit to um, mental well-being, to accessing your intuition, because um, it's basically noticing more stuff, making associations that you know, previously maybe you didn't make or, or other people don't, and thinking outside the box. So, you know, to me, that's that's related to this idea of expanding your consciousness. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break 